This morning, our uh, scripture reading comes to us from Micah, chapter 5, verses 7 through 14. Uh, If you're in the red Bible, it's going to be on pages 658. Oh, sorry. Uh, 658 through 59. Again, that's uh, Micah, chapter 5, verses 7 through 14. The remnant of Jacob will be in the midst of many peoples, like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass, which do not wait for man or linger for mankind. The remnant of Jacob will be among the nations, in the midst of many peoples, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among flocks of sheep, which mauls and mangles as it goes, and no one can rescue. Your hand will be lifted up in triumph over your enemies, and all your foes will be destroyed. In that day, declares the Lord, I will destroy your horses from among you and demolish your chariots. I will destroy the cities of your land and tear down all your strongholds. I will destroy your witchcraft and you will no longer cast spells. I will destroy your carved images and your sacred stones from among you. You will no longer bow down to the work of your hands. I will uproot from among you your Asherah poles and demolish your cities. This is the word of the Lord. Kind of struck me uh, after the reading, we say thanks be to God, but that was kind of a woeful reading. Um, Not that he wrote it poorly. Uh, Woeful, uh, kind of downcast reading. God saying, I will uproot, I will destroy. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to demolish everything that you put your hope in, is what he's saying. And then we say, thanks be to God. (laughs) But we say thanks be to God because it is his word. And it does give us instruction. But my burden isn't so much that it gives us instruction, but that it's what God uses to work in our lives to bring change. There's something special about the Holy Scriptures. And it's the Holy Spirit's method. It's, it's what he uses to, to work in us and to, to fortify us with the life of Christ, to bring us to repentance, to change us. There's nothing else that he uses. Uh, Jesus uses his word and spirit in our lives. And that's why, that's why the Holy Scriptures are so important. Um, this is not just a little lecture. This is the time when the power of God comes down, meets with us through, by his spirit, through his word. Well, we've been going through Micah and uh, the mi- minor prophets, as we call them, because their, their books are little. Um, when I get back, when Sandy and I return back from our sabbatical, I suppose we'll still be in it. Um, you know, John Calvin, uh, he, he went with fire to Geneva to, to change that, that, that city. Uh, it was a party town, and he was going to bring the gospel to it because the Reformation was on fire everywhere. And uh, in two years, they asked him to leave because he was pretty hot-headed, pretty fervent, and uh, pretty humbling for him. And so he left and went to Strasbourg, France. He was a Frenchman, and he was just loving it there because there were a lot of people, um, Frenchmen and women, who were being persecuted for their faith and fleeing to Strasbourg. So he had a vibrant ministry. And then they called him back to Geneva because they couldn't do it without him. And um, basically, he got in the pulpit and he said, as I was saying, (laughs) he just continued on uh, in his lecture series as if nothing had happened. Um, Why did I bring that up? Uh, Well, because I really like the story. Um, But when we get back, I think I will just continue on and say, as we were learning in Micah, or as we were learning in the Minor Prophets, it's been a challenge. Um, as someone once said to me recently, boy, they're pretty down. But yeah, it was a bad time in Israel. Mm-hmm. God takes his holiness and his people's holiness seriously. Well, these were the days, or rather the days when Micah spoke to Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom. They were the days, days of great anxiety and fear uh, among the citizens of those lands. We've learned why, why they had such anxiety and fears. 
the Assyrians steadily moved closer and closer with their army to Samaria, Israel's capital. And then after this, the full force of the Assyrian army would descend upon Jerusalem. Last Lord's Day, I said that the people in their anxieties and their fears turned to the hilltops, looked around on those hilltops where all the idols were worshiped. And they would go up there looking for help from those idols, looking for rescue, looking for deliverance through these difficult times. But these idols were worthless helpers. No matter how much gold they offered the, the priests of these idols, these temples, no matter how much they bowed down to these deaf and dumb, useless blocks of wood and stone, no matter how fervently they worshipped and called upon these gods, the Assyrian army continued to march steadily forward with growing confidence and success. And soon the people would be homeless. They would not have a nation anymore. It would be co completely conquered, and the people would be scattered among the nations of the world back then. They would be what we would call refugees, or as the scripture calls them, strangers and aliens, homeless people in the world, having no place of their own to live, scattered, ripped apart, ripped away from their, their own families and homelands, and now living as strangers in other lands. Micah spoke of this in verse 7. He said, the remnant of Jacob will be in the midst of many peoples. Now, no one, no one would be exempt uh, or spared this impending hardship. It wasn't only the unfaithful and disobedient people who would suffer. The nation's downfall would also affect the faithful and the obedient. Yet they could have hope that God would not abandon them among the nations and the people where they would be scattered, where they would be living as strangers and aliens in the world. God would not leave them. His spirit would be with them and with their children to comfort them, to strengthen them, and to work in among them, to work in them, in their hearts, and then to work among them as a group of people, to, per to persevere, to keep on going, to not give up, and to con continue in faithful obedience to the Lord. You know, really only God can do this kind of work, because when you think of it, someone who is driven from their home, uh, being conquered by a pagan nation, a brutal nation, thinking everything is lost, what are we going to do? And then going out to live among a people that they don't even know their language, perhaps, didn't know the food, with all kinds of religions and, and idols that were being worshipped, then to maintain faithful obedience to the Lord and all this trial and all this difficulty and anxiety. Only God can do that in a person. Only he can work up that kind of faith and hope and courage in people. By his spirit, he does it. And so he will never leave his his elect ones, even though they may suffer with the ungodly. Hurricanes, droughts, devastation, conquest by foreign, land, uh, foreign armies. He will never abandon his people. He will give them perseverance. Micah spoke about this too in verse 7. He said that they would be like dew, morning dew from the Lord like showers on the grass which do not wait for anyone or depend on man. This is how they spoke back then. This is how they looked upon the morning dew on the, on the grass. You know, you might go out. You don't, maybe you don't see it so much in South Texas, but in other uh, parts of the country, you can go out and the, the, the grass is just wet with the morning dew. The rains would come. And this is, um, Michael likens this to refreshment from heaven, life coming secretly, as it were, from heaven. You go out in the morning, and there's the, there's the dew. Then the rains come unexpectedly. Where does it all come from? It comes from heaven. And so, so it is with the life and power of those who stay faithful to the Lord during their sojourns in this world. 
The Lord will care for them from heaven. His, his life and his goodness will come from heaven. And like they will, it'll be like the, the morning dew. We don't create it, it's just there. And so God brings his blessing from heaven to give his people perseverance so that they don't quit, so they don't give up, so that they keep on going forward as strangers in a strange land, knowing that they will reach their homeland someday and their eternal inheritance. The Lord will care for them from heaven. And then moreover, as verse eight says, they will have power within them to endure and overcome the adversities of life. How is this put? This is put in the, in the form of, of or the, the words of their being like lions among sheep, like young lions with full of vibrancy, full of energy. They will never be overcome. Oh, they may suffer greatly. They may be put to death. They may suffer the diseases that the people who don't know God suffer but they won't be overcome by these things. I was talking to a brother the other day, we were talking about things like this, and we, we, we began to realize, you know, we mistakenly think that if we maybe get a disease or if we have a financial setback um, or things don't go well, that we have been overcome. I don't know why we think that way. Why would we be so special that we would not have to suffer like others? Let the other people suffer, not us. But that's not what the scriptures talk about when they say overcoming, overcoming by the power of Christ. It's not that we, are, that we will avoid or be exempt from the sufferings of the, of, of the world. Not at all. What it means is that those things will not will not overcome us. Uh, we can keep on going in the midst of trials and difficulties, not giving up. Marching forward, moving forward, walking forward with power, like a young lion. So we've we, we got to get out of this, out, out of our minds, if it's in your mind, that to overcome, to be, to be a victor in Christ means to have no troubles at all. That's not what it means, because we're in this world of trouble, this world of death and decay. Sometimes it affects us. It always affects us. We're not exempt. But again, so what does it mean to be overcomers? It means that these things do not, this weight does not drag us down so that we can't get up and keep going. We keep going in the midst of suffering, in the midst of trial. That's what it means to overcome. And that's what God is saying to his people here when, he, when he's telling them that things are not going to go well. They're going to be scattered. But I will refresh you from heaven like I refresh the grass with, with rain and the morning dew, and you will have vibrancy in your lives. I will come. I will help you. But you will still be in this world, struggling through it, suffering as a stranger in an exile in a foreign land. And, and we have this hope for our children as well. And so God is calling these people, the vision they are to have, the understanding they are to have is that they, 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 are, to, they uh, are to patiently walk day by day, event by event on the path of righteousness to the inheritance that is awaiting them in their glorious eternal homeland. Day by day, event by event, moment by moment. Keep their eyes fixed on the glory to come. Not thinking at all that they'll ever have that glory here. There's a great weight. If there's anything that holds us back, it's a love of this world and, and trying to find perfection and glory here. It will not happen, my friends. It will not happen. 
And then we start thinking, oh, well, I'll miss out then. I would really like to have this kind of thing while I'm, while I'm alive. Well, just because you don't get it now doesn't mean you're not going to have it. The Lord will reward you. The Lord will give you all your longings when he recreates the earth. And that's what we're walking forward to by faith and obedience. Not looking back, not looking around, but looking up and forward to the glories to come. And, and as they say, you know, the only way this can be done is when we die to self. Put away self's desires, a love for self, thinking that we deserve everything. We've got to have it. No, no, no. Not now. Not now. We struggle putting one leg forward, one foot in front of the other as we make our way to glory building up one another, encouraging one another, praying for one another, all the while knowing that our inheritance awaits us in the glorious land, not here. This is a place of death and decay. We must take our affections off this world. You know, we must learn to be content in the situation God has put us in. And not, and not lose our way by thinking, well, if I only had more in this life, my life would be great. There's probably nothing that will get you off track so easily as that. You'll be consumed by it. And when you don't get it, you'll complain, and you get bitter, and you lose hope. We are strangers and aliens in this world, brothers and sisters. I mean, you want to know what we are like. Think of the, the people in these people coming up from Central and South America, having nothing. That's how we should see ourselves. Well, what do I mean, strangers and aliens in that way? Well, that we are totally dependent on God and his goodness. This world is not our home. We are sometimes struggling forward to a new place, a better place. Doing it while we, re while we remain faithful to our beloved master. I wonder if the Apostle Peter had these verses from Micah on his mind when he wrote to suffering Christians of his day. He called these suffering Christians aliens and strangers in this world, refugees. We find his words in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. He says, To those who are aliens and strangers, scattered here and there, Christians, this world is not your home. Your homeland is elsewhere. And while you live on this earth as it is, you're strangers and aliens. So he, he called Christians by those terms. And then he said, praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials." And when we turn back to Micah, we go to verses 10 through 14, we find that some of the grief and trials come to us from the Lord himself. Notice that at the beginning of verse 10, that Micah says, in that day, declares the Lord. That day refers to the time of our sojourning and living as exiles, or he was referring to these people of ancient times, in that day, meaning the day when you are going to be ripped from your homeland and wander through the world. 
not having a place of your own. In that day, God says, I will destroy your horses from among you and demolish your chariots. I will destroy the cities of your land and tear down all your strongholds. And he talks about other things. These are sheriff poles. These were, these were like uh, carved images. Uh, they're fertility gods that they would bow to and, and just all kinds of weird, debauched, pagan, vile, sensual worship. I will t- I'll get rid of your idols, he's saying. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to, I will destroy, I will uproot, I will demolish everything that you put your trust in. Your horses, your chariots, thinking that these will give us power, these will save us. What this is saying is that God would take away the things of this world that his scattered people might hope in to get them through their journey. His purpose is to teach them to trust in him and to depend on him and to prove to them that he can be trusted. Only in this way would they experience his power and satisfying goodness and faithfulness in this life. Apostle Peter, I'm sure, had this in his mind too when he wrote to the suffering scattered Christians of his time. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, he says, Now for a little while you've had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Brothers and sisters, I need to tell you, and you need to get this into you. We need to all get it into us and ask the Lord to stick it in there, to write it on in our hearts, that all the riches, all the pleasures, all the glories, all the praises of this world are just worthless dung compared to what Christ will give us. When he says, the proven genuineness of your faith may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. This is what we must fix our hope on. This is what we must be determined to achieve at the end of our lives. This is what we seek. And you will not be sorry. You may think, well, woe is me. I don't have much. You will have much when Christ returns if you remain faithful to him and don't give up. And leave him simply because you don't meet this world or your life doesn't meet this world's standards. These have come, these trials, says Peter, so that the proven genuineness of your faith may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Get this, get this, beloved. You will stand before Christ. The whole world will stand before Christ. The dead will be raised, and everyone will stand before him. And oh, how you want him to call your name and to exalt you in front of all the watching world, all those who have ever lived and will ever live, For him to call out your name and say, well done, good and faithful servant. And I tell you this now, that no amount of gold, no amount of the praises of men, no amount of anything of this world can even begin to match the wonder and the joy and the glory and the freshness and the comfort and the security that those words will bring to you. But hear me well, you may not ever hear those words if you fail your your trials. 
Trials prove the genuineness of faith. If you have saving faith, it won't be fun always, but you'll make it to the end because your hope will be in Christ and he will not let you fail. But if you fail under these trials and you turn from Christ, you turn to the things of this world, you give up. Oh, my friends, you won't receive praise and glory and honor. So what do the trials reveal as you, as you examine yourself? And later on in this letter, Peter tells these Christians, he says, examine yourselves. Are you in the faith? What, what are the trials and the stresses of this life? What are they revealing about you? What are they revealing about you? Then Peter goes on, he says, so you'll receive glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. That means when he comes again to judge the living and the dead. Then he goes on, he says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. There it is. There's what we would call maybe the secret to making it. Loving Jesus and holding fast to him and seeing him as your reward and your faithful savior. Not looking to men, not looking to this world, not looking to your possessions, not looking to your intellect, not looking to circumstances, but looking to Jesus Christ, the living Lord. And loving him and adoring him above all the things of this world. And how can you get to that place in life? Well, one way is by prayer. Another way is by reading scripture, knowing scripture, fellowshipping with Christians, but another way, probably the way that we would rather not go through, is the way of suffering. When he removes everything from us and we have no other choice but either to walk away or to trust in him and to take hold of him and say, he loves me, I will not let him go. I will entrust myself to my faithful savior and that's how love grows. That's how we experience his power and his life. Like God's faithful people of Micah's time and the time of the apostle Peter, let us not lose hope during our sojourn in this world. The Lord sovereignly and providentially brings hardship and suffering into our lives so that we will learn to trust him and find that he is far better, infinitely better than anything this world might offer us for hope and comfort. Let us not run to the idols of our day. Let us run to Christ and seeing him as faithful and good and kind and gentle and more than willing to help you. Let us run to Christ and hold fast to him when fears, when the fears and the pressures of this world and life weigh heavy on us. What, what idols might you run to to bring you through the difficulties, the anxieties, the unknowns of life? Do you run to drugs? I don't have in mind what they would call street drugs or recreational drugs. I have in mind the, the drugs in your medicine cabinet, the respectable drugs. Is your first thought to run to them? I'm not against medicine. Antibiotics, boy, what a blessing. I understand that sometimes when we go through difficulties, we need help and we need to get our minds settled and, and, and therapeutic drugs can help. 
But brothers and sisters, we've got to realize that they cannot bring us through this life. They can dull our, what they, what they really do is dull our minds so that the, the, the weight is not so heavy. And then there's counsel to help you work through difficulties, but you cannot depend on them. You must not depend on them. You know, you ever wonder, you ever stop and wonder how the early Christians and not so early Christians, maybe Christians just 300 years ago, made it through life without all these drugs that we may have in our medicine cabinets? You ever wonder how they did that? All they had was the Bible and prayer and the sacraments. That's it. And Christian fellowship, that's all they had. But they made it through. I would say they made it through much better than we're making it through. Think of the Apostle Paul. He said, I mean, he went through great, great physical trauma of some sort uh, that was really humiliating. And uh, who knows what it was. Some people say it was probably something with his eyes. But he didn't want that. So he begged the Lord, take it from me. And the Lord said, I will not take it from you. My grace is sufficient for you. I will bring you through this life, Paul. And then he, the Lord says to Paul, my power is perfected in weakness. Well, that's an amazing thought. What's he saying to Paul? When you're weak, when you're unable That's when you will turn to me. I must remove these supports from you, Paul, so that you will learn to trust in me and depend upon me to get you through so you can do your ministry, so you can live life. And then you know what Paul said? Well, Lord, that's just not fair. No, that's not what he said at all. Paul said, well, then if this is true, I'm just going to boast about my weaknesses. Everyone around him uh, boasted about their greatness. Look at me, what I can do. And other people boasted about them. Look at that preacher. Look at him. Look at that. Da, 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 da. Oh, my, aren't they great? Why? Oh, because they just shine. And they're so handsome. And they're, so, they're such great speakers. And Paul says... That's not what I'm looking for. He says, I will boast about my weaknesses because it's through the weaknesses that the power of Christ comes into our lives. That's when we take hold of Christ and really learn for ourselves how powerful and how good he is, the risen, resurrected Lord. I'm not talking about mind over matter, you know, uh, self-help, Thoughts. I'm talking about taking hold of the one who lives, whom we declare, and I hope we believe when we say the, the, the Apostles' Creed. He ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Is that your Jesus? The living one, who even now is at the right hand of God, the Father, even now sustaining all things by his power? keeping the creation in existence, keeping it functioning according to God's purposes and his providence? Is that your Jesus? Or is it just a philosophy, a thought, mind over matter, positive thinking? Is that what your Jesus is? Is that who he is? That's what he is. He's an idol if that's what he is, just a positive thought. No, he's real. He's living. And so Paul realized, you know, when the Lord humbled me and he took out all my supports, well, this is a good thing because it exposes my weaknesses. And the more weak I am, the more I take hold of Christ's power. And I feel it within me and I can live life.
What are your idols? You have a medicine cabinet full of drugs that you go to to help you beyond what you should. Are they taking the place of Christ? Can you put them aside and say, I, I, will, I will look to Christ. I will call upon him in my struggle. The early Christians did this, and they made it through. You know, I often think of the pilgrims. I get a kind of a bad rap these days, but anyway, uh, how did they make it through that crossing on the Atlantic on the rickety, leaking Mayflower? The word and prayer. Scriptures and prayer and encouraging one another, building one another up. I would not have done that. <laughs> I don't even like flying. We're going to Chicago on Tuesday. I'm already dreading it because I do not like to fly. Well, some Calvinist you are, preacher. Oh, well, yeah, no one's perfect. Are you addicted to drugs? Or maybe your idol is the bottle. You run to the bottle. Not the bottle of whiskey or whatever. If you do do that, put that away. But what I have in mind is the bottle in the medicine cabinet. We might be quick to condemn or look down on the person who has a beer or drinks a whiskey, but we don't have any issues, it seems, guzzling the narcotic-laced elixir we buy from the pharmacy. For some reason, when we buy it from the pharmacy, it's okay. Maybe far, far worse for us in the long run than, than a beer or whatever. Or maybe, maybe food is your idol that you run to to give you pleasure and security in the world of distress. Or it might be that you watch pornography to get, what is it, the rush of dopamine that overpowers the fears, the frustrations, the anxieties, or whatever. It puts you in that heady, whatever it is. Do not run to the idols of our society when distress meets you on the path to your glorious inheritance entrust yourself to Jesus or maybe put entrust yourself more and more and more to him say no to these things and yes to Christ and be willing to wait patiently for him to act call upon him to uphold you he is living he is a living savior powerful savior risen from the dead how could he not help you? Why would he not help you? Why would he not uphold you? Why would he not strengthen you? Answer that question to yourself. Why would he not? Why would he not get you to the end of your journey? The Apostle Peter said that it's faith that keeps us going. It's faith that shields us, faith that protects us. I suppose if we say, well, I think he would not, is because I'm just not such a good person. Well, no, you're not. <laughs> but it's not our works. It's not our ability. It's not what we do that keeps Christ holding on to us. It's our trust in him. That's it. Holding to him. Entrusting ourselves to his goodness, his faithfulness, not on our ability to impress him. I suppose if there's anything that keeps us reaching for that stuff in the medicine cabinet, it's when we get to the point where we say, I failed the Lord again. I'm just no good. Gulp, 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 gulp. Oh, now I feel better. And I don't have that burden on me anymore until you fail again. And you will fail again. Thank him that he does not 
minister to us according to how good we do it, how, how great we are as Christians. <clears throat> we are shielded by faith, faith alone. Christ says, trust me. Forget about yourself. Forget about your mistakes, your failings. Trust me. I will not fail you. And this is what grace is. And Christ offers it to you. Call upon him. Look to him to give you his life from heaven like the dew, the morning dew and the rain, which renew what's dry and dying. Look to him to make you strong and vibrant like a young lion as you go through the adversities of life. Turn from your idols to Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, and experience the vibrancy and power of his life that the Holy Spirit will bring to you. This is what I offer. This is the gospel. Let's pray. Now we thank you, Lord Jesus, for these words of truth. I pray that you would so work in our lives that we would really start thinking less and less of this world, that you and your kindness and your power, your eternal glory, would be more and more delightful to us, more and more striking, more and more awesome. And that you and mercy would help us through this life of travail and tears until we stand before you and share in the everlasting glory that you will give to us. Amen. We invite you to take your hymnal again, turn to number 97, as we have uh, the last song of worship in our uh, formal worship today. Go out and worship God in your lives, but uh, number 97, we praise you, O God, our Redeemer, Creator. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the Holy Spirit, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all now and forever. Amen. Please stay and visit. We've got to set up some tables for our lunch, so if you could uh, take a few moments to greet one another, to visit, to encourage, and then set up the tables so we can uh, have fun. <laughs>